the topic that you gave me is a challenging one. Um, the, the notion of a Jewish conception uh, of just war. Uh, as, I, as I began to work on it, I realized that, that there is, I, in my years at the, at the seminary, rabbinic seminary, we never discussed that topic. Uh, and there must be a reason for that. Uh, I noticed that there is, if, if, uh, on, your, on, your, uh, on this pamphlet, there, there, there's a Hebrew that says, Melchemet uh, Hatzodeket, uh, which I guess is a Hebrew translation for the word just war. But the fact of the matter is that there is no phrase uh, for just war that appears in Jewish religious, it's a, it's a neology, it's an invented word, I think, special for the brochure. Uh, it's not a concept, it's not a word that's used anywhere uh, in, in Jewish texts themselves. Uh, so I, I, could, I could make this a very short presentation. Uh, by, by talking about the key kind, the, the Jewish concept of just war by saying there is none. Uh, but of course, you wouldn't have flown me all the way here just to, <laughs> and I couldn't say there is none in, in the 20,000 words that are required. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, however, that there are precious few examples of, uh, of, of the discussion of anything approximating just war uh, in Jewish foundational texts. And there's a reason for that. There is, in this instance, a significant asymmetry between the Jewish tradition on one hand and the Christian and Muslim traditions uh, on the other hand. Uh, because, of course, both the, the Christian and the Muslim communities had the opportunity, had the agency with which to wage war and therefore had to reflect on, on the implications of that and the application of that. Uh, and from the year 1972 until well into the 20th century, uh, the Jewish community had no opportunity, no agency uh, to wage war. Uh, and so no internal incentive uh, to reflect on, on the justice of that activity. Um, there are, however, precious few instances in which the subject is, seems to be discussed. And I wonder what I would like to attempt with you today is to extrapolate uh, from those some references in Jewish texts something that might approximate uh, a, a, a concept of just war. The first, the first consideration, I guess, that I would, I would say is that it's possible for a person who's not terribly familiar with Jewish reality uh, to presume uh, that the Jewish tradition would say that no war is just. If you just read uh, the Bible, it is possibly, the Hebrew scriptures, it's possibly left with the impression that there's only a concern about peace. After all, both Mike and Isaiah talk about looking forward to that time uh, when they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war uh, anymore. Uh, and it is true that over and over again in, in uh, Hebrew scriptures, there is, there is uh, an anticipation looking forward to an appreciation, an affirmation of the concept of shalom. I'm going to come back to shalom again in a minute. The similar, the similar thing is true if you look at, uh, if you look cursorily uh, at rabbinic texts. Uh, the rabbis also seem to talk about peace a great deal. They, one, of the, one famous rabbinic aphorism is the world is sustained by three things, uh, by truth, by justice, and by peace. Or elsewhere uh, among the rabbis is written, everything in the Torah is written to promote peace. Everything is written to promote peace. Uh, I want to offer several caveats. Uh, to, to making the jump that we all too easily make about that being an affirmation of, uh, of, of peace. Uh, the first thing is the word shalom itself does not necessarily, does not exclusively mean a cessation of military conflict. Uh, shalom has a generalized sense of well-being or wholeness uh, rather than simply being an absence of armed conflict. It's true shalom can uh, mean peace, but more conventionally, it means more prosaic kinds of, of emotions. The, absent, home, the homely absence of conflict in the home, uh, between individuals, uh, inner tranquility. Uh, when uh, in contemporary or modern Hebrew, when, someone, when you want to ask how somebody is doing, you say, you know, mashalom so-and-so. Uh, you're not saying, you know, uh, has so-and-so avoided military engagement. Uh, you're asking, how is he doing? Uh, the instances when peace, peace shows up a lot uh, in the Jewish liturgy. Uh, 
or shalom shows up a lot in the Jewish literature. But the shalom that's prayed for is not necessarily the shalom of our borders, uh, but the shalom that comes at, at the end of time, uh, in the world to come that we referenced uh, this morning, in what, what could be called the Messianic Age. Remember, it shall come to pass in the end of days uh, that they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears uh, into pruning hooks. We're moving closer to a conversation now about just war itself. Uh, peace, the Jewish tradition is, a, is ethically a very realistic tradition. Peace is not always possible. War sometimes does become necessary. A, uh, and, and, and you hear that, and, uh, and you hear that in the Bible itself. Uh, there's this a, a, a kind of, to us, shocking uh, vision in the prophet Joel. Proclaim among the nations, prepare for battle, rouse the warriors, let all the fighting men come and draw near, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Uh, that's the, that, that's the, a clear contrary position. Um, and of course, I think the dispositive, the final statement about this, uh, is, uh, is found in the book of Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Uh, Lawrence Schiffman has written, uh, there has always been a strand of Jewish thought which considered war to be an instrument by which God could bring about the redemption of God's people. Uh, it's important to note. I don't want to suggest uh, that, there are, that there have never been Jewish pacifists. I'm not suggesting that it's impossible to construct a Jewish pacifism. Uh, but I do want to suggest that pacifism is not the default position uh, of, of the Jewish tradition, uh, that it is a tradition that recognizes war. So with that, we turn uh, to war uh, and warfare in the Hebrew Bible. Because in any conversation of Jewish religiousness, you start with the Bible. It, it is, uh, as, as Reuben reminded us yesterday, Jewish discussion about any issue does not, be, does not end with the Bible. And it's, not the, it's not the final word, certainly not the only word, but it's the first word. Uh, and, it is, and, and the Bible becomes, it, again, when I say Bible, of course, I'm talking about Hebrew Scripture. The, the Hebrew Scripture, I, it's difficult for me to say Hebrew Scriptures. It's much easier to say Bible. Uh, the Bible, Torah means, can I say Torah? Torah means, uh, for uh, the Torah is extrapolated. The Torah is studied over and, and, and explored uh, and, uh, and interrogated. Uh, and, that, and, and the interrogation of the fundamental text uh, is what provides the evolution uh, of the tradition. So we begin. We, some people who don't know better uh, would assume that, again, the, the the, the, the final word about war or anything of that nature is found, of course, in the Ten Commandments, where they imagine it says, thou shalt not kill. Uh, but every, uh, everybody who knows better knows that the Ten Commandments don't say, thou shalt not kill. It says, love your side, don't, don't murder. Uh, and murdering is, of course, different than killing. And by, by, by implication, the distinction recognizes that there are times when killing another human being is appropriate and even perhaps uh, necessary. And so killing itself seems countenanced by the Bible. The Bible does not seem to have uh, aversion to the notion of killing. There are times when it, when it is appropriate that, it's, that it must be done, needs to be done. And war, and this is the most important thing I say about the Bible, war seems to be accepted as a natural part of the human condition. Shocking as that may seem to us, and perhaps distasteful to modern sensibilities, War is recognized as a natural part of the human condition. Genesis takes it as a matter of course that Abraham would be a powerful and successful military leader. You know, when we, when we talk about the, 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 the qualities of Abraham, we often forget that he was a military leader. Uh, Joshua's prowess as a military leader is evidenced in the midst of the Exodus as well as in the eponymous book that describes his putative conquest of the land of Canaan. The role of judges in the books of Judges is not a judicial one, but a military one. They're military leaders. Their fame and their place in history was established by the victories on the field of battle. And of course, King Saul and King David, as well as the lesser kings who succeeded them, were all men of arms. Uh, Hebrew scriptures takes this not as something meriting special comment, but regarded simply as a matter of course. Of course, 
uh, they would be military men. Indeed, savingly, God and God's own self is depicted as a warrior. When Julius Wellhausen goes so far as to suggest the name Israel, Israel means God does battle. And Jehovah was the warrior, El, after whom the nation styled itself. The military camp, says Wellhausen, was so to speak at once the cradle in which the nation was nursed and the smithy in which it was welded into unity. Famously, in the book of Exodus, uh, the song of the sea exalts, the Lord, the warrior, Lord is his name, Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he has cast into the sea. Uh, the people in the book of Deuteronomy are assured that God will go to war, will engage in war on their behalf. Uh, the same imagery is echoed elsewhere in the Bible as well. I'm not going to give all the details here. Indeed, God the warrior is depicted as viewing war in a positive light and explaining why the nation under Joshua merely gained entry into the land, but left whole swaths of it unconquered. God is depicted as having done so with a purpose. So that, it says in, Josh, in Judges, he might test the unconquered nation, all the Israelites who had not known any war of any of the wars of Canaan, so that succeeding generations of Israelites might be made to experience war. Um, and so, Again, war itself, war is accepted. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things in the, in the short history of King Saul was, of course, that Saul was reproached by God and disowned by God for not being um, fierce enough uh, and, and totally extirpating, totally exterminating uh, the enemies. Um, and then there is the, then there's the, 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 the Torah doesn't even hold back on discussing, on presenting war in all of its violence. Uh, you've got Joshua, the accounts of Joshua's victories at Jericho and Ai, which are very bloody. For all, for all of, uh, of our attachment to the Bible, there's certain parts of it that you really you want your children uh, to read. You don't want your children to read parts of, of Joshua. They're just too nasty. In sum, it would be hard to argue that the Bible seems more than amenable to war. It accepts it as part of the natural course of things. And yet, that, that too is not the final word. Uh, you, you won't be surprised uh, to hear me suggest, as Reuven has done before me, that, you, that we can't impose the expectation of consistency on Hebrew scriptures. It is, it is inconsistent. It represents many perspectives. It was, it came together over a long period of time. Uh, and so it will often say things and the opposite of those things. What I do see in, in the Bible, uh, I, I do see it reflecting the time and place of its composition, of its redaction. Uh, it represents the culture of a particular time and a particular place. And yet there is this wonderful paradoxical move in the Bible. Uh, it both accepts prevailing cultural patterns and, the, and subtly subverts them. Uh, it, does that, it does that on numerous issues. The role of women is one, slavery is one, and I'm going to suggest that war is one too. Uh, the Bible is filled with war and warriors uh, and, the, and the invocation of battle. And yet, war in the battle does not seem to conform to Hobbes' vision of a perpetual war of all against all, uh, the life that societies live being defined by ongoing conflicts, engaged in a terrible cycle of retribution, blood feuds, revenge for wrongs done to the tribe or the family. It's not all eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, the Bible subtly imposes restrictions on the conduct of war, and from these one could begin, can begin to extrapolate something of an image of just war. Uh, on the subject of taking plunder in this paradoxical movement, the Bible both accepts the prevailing social norm and imposes limitations on it, thus subverting it. Uh, in Genesis and Deuteronomy, Joshua, Samuel, and Esther, uh, there is an attitude reflected saying, uh, re rejecting, rejecting the taking of spoils. Saul was reprimanded for not taking spoils. 
and yet elsewhere in that same in the same canon uh, is this limitation of taking sport of. Nor apparently were wars fought for the purpose of expanding territory. Wars did not seem wars were fought for the purpose of taking territory, protecting territory, not for the purpose of expanding territory. Uh, which introduces something that must be considered a new element in the phenomenon of war, and that is rationale. The, the war, in order to be fought, needed to have a reason. Each of the wars in the Bible is presented not as simply a fact of life, uh, but as a necessary consequence of certain previous uh, commitments, certain specified purposes. Each of the wars was fought for a for the. It, and the range of, 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 of purposes is quite uh, circumscribed. Wars were fought either for the purpose of fulfilling God's promise to the people of Israel or to guarantee their uh, security in, in the territory that was promised to them. And now I'm going to move to the book of Deuteronomy. I'm speeding things up a little bit. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we find a remarkable section that, uh, that helps us moves us further along in explicating or enunciating principles that might be considered to be rudiments of just war theory with regard to, to waging war. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapters 20 especially introduced significant innovations in war fighting. Remarkable innovations. In war. Soldiers who wish to be excused from fighting for any reason, including simple terror, are granted exemptions. This injunction seems to negate the possibility of random conscription, one potential source of injustice in the waging of war. Additionally, Deuteronomy 20 requires that when a city is being besieged, its fruit-bearing trees are not to be cut down. Don't cut down trees, which means don't cut down the possibility of a, of a, of a community after the war sustaining itself, feeding itself, providing uh, for itself. In the same chapter, we read an even more dramatic modification of a value system which might otherwise be assumed to embrace the ideology of total war. Israelite armies are required to offer besieged enemy cities the opportunity to sue for peace. You can't just simply attack the city, you have to give them the opportunity to sue for peace. And the treatment of women, uh, also in, in, in this one is Deuteronomy 21, is also quite remarkable. Uh, women of conquered nations can, yes, be included in the spoils of war. Uh, but that, too, is subject to further modification. We find extensive legislation which emphasizes the humanity of those collateral victims. It mandates procedures which temper the bloodlust and sexual lust of battle. Thus, if a soldier desires to appropriate for himself a woman of a conquered city or nation, he has to treat her not as a pillaged object, but he has to render her her due humanity. She must be considered a wife. She has to be given time to mourn for the family and the life that she lost. She has to be given a, a proper period of mourning. Uh, and if after that period of cooling off, or perhaps if at any point in the future, the soldier loses his desire for her, he can't treat her like a commodity. He can't sell her or, or trade her away. He can't treat her like a slave. He must give her her freedom. Uh, to leave in freedom, and she is given the opportunity, the right, she has the right uh, to chart her course for her own future. All of these practices, uh, in all of them, uh, the unmoderated ferocity of war making is tempered by considerations of the humanity of the enemy. An element of empathy and simple human fellow feeling is now introduced into the conduct of battle. Uh, and in this too, we can find a more uh, move towards some kind of an understanding that we would uh, relate to what we would call just war theory. And then, interestingly enough, the Bible reflects uh, a consciousness that its own practices were in marked contrast with those of the, uh, those of the surrounding peoples. Uh, the prophet Nahum condemns, I take that as a sign that Area in some direction, but I'm not sure which one. I'm not sure which one. Yes, thank, thank you, <laughs> and good night. Uh, the uh, the prophet Nahum condemns Nineveh's indulgence in booty and plunder. Uh, the prophet Amos makes mention of the cruel military practices of the neighboring peoples. Uh, and in the Book of Kings, we find an interesting uh, narrative about uh, that turns the 
it turns on the fact that neighboring peoples knew that the kings of the house of Israel were merciful. Uh, and relates how uh, an Israelite king magnanimously spared the life of the opposing monarch and his minion. Can we consider these constraints on the conduct of the battle, the circumscription of what warriors are allowed to do, to be a systematic theory of jus in bello, the rules of the conduct of the war? Probably not. Uh, but at least they represent some kind of a move in the direction of what we would call uh, just war theory. The, it is noted that this, this Torah, this Bible, does not have the last word. It's succeeded by the rabbinic literature, uh, which comments on it and extrapolates meaning from it. Uh, and here, it's very important to remember uh, that the, uh, the, the rabbis are often misunderstood. They're often seen as legislating. Uh, but of course, these rabbis who, who, did the, who wrote these commentaries on the Bible and extrapolated rules, as it were, uh, from them, uh, they, they really were never able to enact or impose or enforce laws. Uh, they, they, uh, they lacked agency. They were not sovereign of any territory. They had no access uh, to sovereignty. Uh, and so it's, in, in looking at any rabbinic statement, it's important to remember that everything they said about practical issues like war, at least, were purely speculative or theoretical, even imaginary. They had no lived experience making decisions. In fact, when the, when the rabbis say dina de mahuta dina, the law of the, of the land, is the law of, of the land that we live in is the law, it's a way of kind of recognizing that that's the law. Uh, whatever they were saying uh, was, was not the law. And they were engaged in intellectual speculation. Uh, and also, when we talk about the rabbis, uh, we can't imagine, or we, can't, we can't allow ourselves the luxury of imagining that they articulated a consistent theory about anything. What we find in rabbinic literature is a multi-century symposium, a vast collection of widely diverse perspectives on all manner of issues, including some scant attention to issues that would fall under our category of, of just war. Uh, which wars are justly fought? Uh, what is the just manner of pursuing a war? Uh, but again, not, what, what the rabbis are engaged in is interpretation of the layer of, of, of text that came before them. Um, they, they are not taking, they're not making dispositive final positions on, on any, of, any of these issues. Uh, but there are certain general perspectives that do show up in the rabbis. Uh, killing another is not ever strictly forbidden. Another rabbinic perspective that can be extrapolated from this is the notion that a defensive war can be fought. It's found in the midst of a discussion of robbery in the home. It is assumed that a man need not hold back with regard to protecting his property. A thief might say, if I go into his house and rob it, he, the householder, will resist me and prevent me from stealing, so I must kill him. Concerning this, this is not an interpretation of the Torah verse, if someone comes to kill you, get up early in the morning to kill him first. Does that, is that some kind of a rabbinic move in the direction of allowing, permitting uh, defensive war, preemptive uh, defensive war? Uh, it seems to suggest that war waged in self-defense, even preemptive self-defense, can be considered uh, to be included in what is uh, permissible. One other rabbinic teaching uh, presents a perspective on the waging of war in general, which might have also some bearing on the question of just war. Rabbi Jose the Galilean states, even in the time of war, Jewish law requires that one must initiate discussions of peace. He's reinforcing, he's re-articulating what we already saw uh, in, in, in the Torah itself. And then we come to this into an interesting set of, of terms that, do, that are rabbinic, and that do not appear in the Torah. Uh, to what kind of wars, uh, they're, not, they're not talking, here's a commentary on Deuteronomy, on the Deuteronomy deferment section of that we talked about. So what kind of wars did the deferments enumerated do not around me refer to? Mechamet HaRashut. But in a Mechamet Mitzvah, we'll come back to the meaning of these terms. Mechamet Mitzvah, everyone has to go. Even a bridegroom from his chamber and a bride from her canopy couch. Rabbi Judah said, to what kind of war did the deferments enumerated do not refer to? To a Mechamet Mitzvah. But in a Mechamet Chova, everyone has to go. Even a bridegroom from his chamber 
We've got, you know, it, it, it looks like this is redundant. You've got three different categories here. Milchemet um, Mitzvah is, is constant. The other two are Milchemet Chova and Milchemet Arashu. Um, what do these mean? Milchemet well, Mitzvah sounds like it is a commanded war. So that, that, that you, what, what, what we're going to see here uh, is, is a bifurcation of, the, of, of types of war, typology of war. Milchemet Mitzvah is a commanded war, war that you can't avoid. And then you've got these two other things that, that sound like they're the same thing, but they're actually opposite each other. And, 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 and the rabbis neither interpret or, or, or clarify uh, what these are all about. Uh, they do make a distinction between milchemet mitzvah and milchemet, uh, commanded war uh, and a, 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 a voluntary war. Uh, the other one is a, a uh, Milchemet Mitzvah, commanded war, and Milchemet Chova, an obligatory war. Uh, are these separate categories? Are they, are, do, do they blend together? We, we never get absolute clarity about that. Clearly, clearly, in the way that it talks, the, the Milchemet Mitzvah is a war that cannot, that cannot be avoided. The, 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 the two categories that are going to end up being significant are Milchemet Mitzvah, the, the obligatory war, and then, and then a voluntary war, as it were. Uh, those are going to be distinguished from each other. Defensive wars are considered obligatory wars, and, th and therefore just wars. Um, the, it says uh, in, in the Talmud, the, 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 the Talmud that I'm referring to here is the uh, Talmud Sota, uh, the Mishnah teaches, the Mishnah that we just looked at, to what kind of wars do the affirmance of the Mary and Deuteronomy refer? They are said with regard to a discretionary war, as opposed to an obligatory war or commanded war. <coughs> Rabbi Yochanan says, concerning the various categories of war, the discretionary war referred by the rabbis is the same as commanded referred to by Rabbi Judah. Commanded war mentioned in the rabbis is the same as obligatory war. Commanded war, obligatory war, those, those cannot be avoided, and you, you're not, according to the rabbis, shouldn't even get a deferment. The most consistent thing, and the most troubling thing, and in a way, perhaps the thing that is worth reflecting on, speculatively, not historically, uh, is that when the rabbis talk about, talk about war, uh, they talk about war in terms of the events described in the Bible. I think that's significant. Uh, it gives, it, the way that they talk about biblical wars gives us a, broad contours of the meaning of these various terms. In this construct, obligatory wars were those fought to secure the land of Israel for the children of Israel. Discretionary wars are understood as wars of expansion, which do not involve acquiring or defending the land or protecting the people. But we must note that while reference to Joshua's wars is self-explanatory, they talk also about David's wars. Uh, and it's totally unclear which of David's wars they were referring to. David fought wars of defense against the Philistines, but he also fought wars of expansion and plunder. Uh, the latter raised issues that are in need of being addressed. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, one of the rabbis notes uh, that there is a disagreement in how to categorize wars, uh, what the wars are and what the rabbis construe as necessary to preserve the spiritual integrity of the people. There's a, a, a long piece that I'm going to read to you uh, from, from the Talmud Tractate Brachot, uh, which raises, which, which, which I think kind of clarif can help clarify the thinking about this as an issue. Uh, it talks about the, it talks about the, the, it is a commentary on the first book of Samuel, chapter 30. When dawn arrived, the sage of Israel entered to advise him, David, with regard to the various concerns of the nation and the economy. They said to him, our master, the king, your nation requires sustenance. He said, go and sustain one another, provide each other with whatever is lacking. The sages of Israel responded to him with a parable. A single handful of food does not satisfy a lion, and a pit will not fill merely from the rain that falls directly into its mouth, but other water must be piped into it. So, too, the nation cannot sustain itself using its own resources. King David told them, go and take up arms and troops and battle in order to expand our borders and provide our people with the opportunity to earn a livelihood. 
uh, Rav Yosef said, upon what verse is this story based? As it is written, after Akitophel was the Hudaya, uh, the son of Benaiah, and everything, the general of the king's army, Yohar. The individuals named in this war correspond with the roles of, uh, in, the, in the legend as follows. Akitophel is the advisor whose advice they saw first with regard to going to war. And so it says, now we'll get the counsel of Akintofel, which he counseled in those days. The sages immediately seek the advice of Akintofel to determine whether or not it's appropriate to go to war at the time and how they should conduct themselves. And they consult the Sanhedrin in order to receive the requisite license to wage a war under those circumstances. And they ask the Urim and Tumim whether they should go to war and whether or not they would be successful. In this, I think it's, this is a remarkable text. The rabbis discuss the biblical account of David's participation in a discretionary war. Now, there's a discretionary, they just, uh, more specifically, this is a war initiated for the purpose of plunder. Clearly, they couldn't consider it proper to take issue with the actions of any, burst, any biblical personage, least of all King David. And so they don't allow themselves to criticize the war. But in a move that not at all is not at all uncharacteristic of rabbinic decision, while accepting biblical action or injunction, they hedge about it with qualification, and as a result, they circumscribe its post-biblical applicability. The text refers to David consulting the Sanhedrin. Significant. We we recognize that this is clearly ahistorical. Sanhedrin did not exist in the time of David. Uh, they talk about. David taking consultation with the Urim and Tumim, which were which were which were, were worn by the high priests, well before the time of David. Yeah, uh, they, he had to consult that as well. Uh, the notion of requiring David to consult the certainly the institution of the Sanhedrin leaves a clear lesson: wars of expansion or initiated for plunder are clearly in a different category than other wars known to the rabbis. The impression that is left by this text is that the king cannot take a war of this type on his own initiative. Some have suggested that given the reality that the Sanhedrin no longer was in existence, the rabbis are suggesting that such wars cannot, or perhaps should not, be entered into at all. At the very least, the rabbis are signaling a certain skepticism about such endeavors. Discretionary wars, wars for expansion or plunder, are presented as less acceptable than Joshua's wars of conquest of the land or later wars fought in defense of the land of Israel. We can say with, I can say with certainty, that discretionary wars are given many more layers of accountability than the divinely commanded wars or obligatory wars. It is hard to abstract any particular perspective on just war from any of these <laughs> rabbinic text, uh, and nor is it possible to extract any, any particular perspective from all of them together. They're not consistent, uh, they're not congruent among themselves, they're opaque, uh, in that they don't provide clear definitions for the various categories they explore, which makes it hard to state with certainty uh, what they affirm and what they disallow. Michael Broida offers a pr provocative suggestion about this unsystematic nature of the rabbi's discussion of issues related to war. He argues, in effect, that war, by its very nature, involves or demands a suspension of conventional ethics or legal considerations. Here's what he says. The conventional reason behind this absence of systematic discussion of war is pointed out by Rabbi Eliezer Yehuda Waldenberg, who posits two points. The first is that war is different from individual ethics. It has a different set of rules. The second is that governmental decisions are different from individual decisions and also follow a separate set of rules. David Schatz says, puts it more explicitly, the conduct of war is in fact the suspension of normative ethics of Jewish law, which explains the paucity of halakhic legal material on the conduct of war. Since halakha envisions war to entail the suspension of all violations, from the prohibition to kill downward. It permits the violation as military need requires of every prohibition with the single exception of idolatry. It would seem that the task of creating a system of laws for an anomic situation is a contradiction in terms, a self-defeating effort. Uh, Broida and Schatz suggest that this accounts for why the rabbis 
do not give us a more systematic discussion of war and establishes a, and establish a more definite statement of norms for its conduct. And yet the railways did have various discrete observations and prescriptions for the waging of war. Uh, the issue is, do these statements have any bearing on situations beyond the specific ones they describe? The rabbis talk about war in reference to the specific, specific circumstance of a specific, a specific time and place. You could argue that by relating their categories exclusively to biblical history, they make them virtually irrelevant to other situations. It would be exceedingly difficult to create general principles of war from their references. On the other hand, I would argue that given the nature of the specific narrative cited, it is possible to extrapolate from them principles that do apply more generally we can discern clearly that wars of territorial integrity are considered permissible. Similarly, wars of self-defense are also regarded in a positive light. More questionable are wars fought simply for self-aggrandizement, to expand territory, or in pursuit of spoils. It may be possible to extrapolate from the text of the Talmud that we, that we read that discretionary wars are viewed with less approbation and significant skepticism. Procedures and processes need to be put in place to contain them. The rabbis not only create a typology of war, their presentation suggests a hierarchy of values as well. In, in, in the Middle Ages, I'm going to speak about this very briefly, uh, the, 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 the great thinkers of the Middle Ages devoted themselves primarily to elucidating what was written in the Bible, the rabbinic text, or create, uh, not in creating systematic presentations of the, uh, attempting to create systematic presentations of the rules articulated in them. Rather than branching off into new areas of speculation, Jewish thinkers dug, in the Middle Ages, dug deeper into the foundational texts that they received from earlier ages. Uh, and so we'll, we will find, uh, of course, Maimonides, who lived in the 12th to 13th century, uh, attempting to organize the rules of the rabbinic text into a systematic form. Uh, his legal magnum opus, the Mishnah Torah, uh, concludes with a section uh, that is devoted to kings and their wars. Uh, we, it, it, we offhandedly assume that, that Maimonides you know, made the definitive statement. Uh, actually, uh, he, he merely I think, refines what went before. Uh, the, the, he, he limits the categories of war to two, commanded and discretionary. Uh, he recognizes that the positive necessity of commanded wars, I'm speeding along here. Uh, he, he talks about war in such a way uh, that you are left wondering whether, it, it, whether he's talking about war as being a reality only in the past uh, or in the distant future. What do you do about war in the, in the world, in the intermediary world, the intermediate world that we're uh, living in now? What does he talk, what does he teach us about wars, uh, as it were, today, uh, between the end of the biblical period and the coming of the Messiah? He does make one significant innovation. Uh, he changes the conventional definitions of the subjects he addresses. He appears to expand the meaning of commanded war uh, to the elimination of idolatry. And it's, I'm mentioning this here because I think it's, you know, it, it, commanded war is not simply a war that's made now for self-defense, it's also made for religious defense, made against idolatry. He frames his uh, discussion uh, in the explicit assertion that this does not necessitate conversion to Judaism, but rather the acceptance uh, by non-Jews of the Noahide law. In this, and this is the, this, in, in this expansion of the meaning of commanded war, to include the elimination of idolatry, uh, he reflects the period of his own writing. He, re he reflects the kind of just war thinking uh, that Suleiman is going to share with us, I think, later, from the Muslim tradition. He reflects the Muslim environment uh, in which he was writing and the kind of the latitudinarian attitude toward uh, the waging of uh, the waging war for that purpose. Maimonides was succeeded by, uh, by another giant, Nachmanides. Uh, who advocates for the literal? Thank you. I'm. 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 I've been warned. I'm going to ignore the warning. No. Well, uh, he advocates for the literal meaning of the biblical text. 
uh, the, narrat uh, the narratives of wars that were fought and the rules of war that they fought again, maybe, that may be fought again when the Messiah comes, are about the literal battle for the conquest of the land of Israel. For Nachmanides, the, the war is fought only for the conquest of the, or the defense of the land of Israel. In this way, he has the effect of reducing the implications of the biblical narrative and any laws derived from them, limiting their elevation, re relevance to that one particular circumstance. He insists on the historical specificity of the time and place of any biblical and Talmudic discussion of Jews ad bellum and Jews in bellum. Would this too imply that all wars fought in the historical period between the end of the Bible and the coming of the Messiah must be considered discretionary wars and thus subject to a degree of skepticism or even viewed in a negative light? Um, that's, uh, this, this is probably a symbol for me to stop. Uh, <laughs> what, what will appear and what, what will be written, uh, but probably won't, and if you ask me the question, I'll answer it today. Uh, war, was not dis war was really not discussed seriously for the eight centuries between Nachmanides and the 20th, and the 20th century. What was written in the 20th century is to me extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, Ruvain and I, uh, take strongly divergent positions on, on Jewish thought uh, uh, in, in the 20th century. Um, if you ask me my if you ask me the question, I can go into it in greater length. If you don't ask me the question, you'll never know until you read the book. Uh, but but what was written in the 20th century was not primary. Most of what was not written by by in religious context uh, was re was written by. Jews now returning to the land and trying to make sense of the obligations placed on them in that context. But given that, that Ruvain and I do agree uh, that what we call Judaism is not merely an ism, it's not really, it's not exclusive religion, but also the, the collective cultural expression of the people. Uh, what was said by, uh, by early Zionist leaders and by the military of the State of Israel, I think, it, I think you will find it instructive when you read it in the book or ask me a question. Thank you very much for your attention.